Praise the Lord. You know, it's so exciting to be together with you again today. And thank you for all your words of encouragement and your prayers and your support. We are grateful for all the body that's gathering together throughout the 24-hour period when we look at a discipleship empowerment word. We're grateful. Uh, you know, yesterday I had a phone call from Africa and uh, the pastor there was just saying, you know, please keep teaching. <laughs> please keep encouraging. Colin and I were uh, thinking about it last night. Just yesterday alone, we were at a interacting with Africa and then um, Nepal, Japan, Myanmar, Myanmar and Australia. Australia, and part of Canada, all in one day. Can you imagine that? <laughs> and so, wow, technology has really changed things over the years, hasn't it? I mean, where you can interact with, you know, five countries in one day. I remember reading stories where they would put a, a, a mission board, would put a letter on a ship to send out to their missionary. It would take six months to get to some of those locations in Asia. The missionary would respond and send a response back by letter, take another six months to get back. And so a year it would take to come up with some type of decision. Wow, talk about long suffering and endurance. But nowadays, you know, we, I know you're like me, some of you, you send out an email and sometimes you, you hope to hear back right away or sometimes within a day or so, you know, and you're wondering then, well, if the person doesn't respond or whatever, you know, then maybe you need to email them or phone them again or whatever. But wow, technology has made it possible for us to be able to minister in various places around the world. And I just want to encourage you, um, our brothers and sisters in uh, Nagaland, watch every day. Uh, Pastor Mazua, God bless you. And Ezekiel, God bless you. You know, uh, men and their families and women of God uh, being used by the Lord all the way around. And again, we, you know, we could just yesterday, as I said, five countries we were in contact with and, and speaking with in some form or fashion. So keep praying for the ministry, keep praying for what God is doing, and that he will give us much direction. Well, as you know, on our discipleship and empowerment word that we've been studying for the last little while is the word holy, and how it acts or affects us in holiness. You know, a disciple of Christ is to be walking in holiness, and I know for you, that's a word we want to stay away from, because we don't always do a very good job of walking in holiness. And sometimes things happen to us or sometimes events go on and, and there's kind of a knee-jerk reaction and there's not always the holiness that should be there. But today we're going to look at a little bit how how holiness is is brought to us from the Psalms, from the idea that we need to remember again the good things what God has done. And if I was to put a title on today, I would just think about the whole area of holy forgiveness. You know, I mean, God is so good. And whether sometimes we don't deserve forgiveness, but our holy God gives us holy forgiveness. Because when it comes from him, why I say holy forgiveness, because if he gives forgiveness... Because he is holy, and what he gives then becomes holy, it also becomes a holy forgiveness for us. I know that's kind of joining the dots all the way along, but it's true. You know what God gives to us is holy, amen? And when we look into Psalms 99 today, there is this idea of forgiveness amongst the words. And again, I've, I've always been saying how important it is to look at the words around the word that we're studying. Seeing how things are connecting. See what the context. Why was this word put there? You know, because if we believe that the word of God is is uh, spoken forth by the power of God, inerrant, you know, without mistake, uh, you know, it's in proper order, it's for the proper purpose, then we need to take note of those words that are around. Amen. And so when we go to Psalm 99, uh, it's interesting that the 
subtitle that is put here on Psalm 99. It says, Praise the Lord for His Holiness. That's the title of the chapter. Now, we know that these titles have been put in afterwards. They weren't there from the very beginning. But I just thought it was interesting. Praise the Lord for His Holiness. You know, over in uh, Nagaland, when we were there, they would always say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You know what I mean? And that's what it's all about, you know, that they would just, you know, spend time praising the Lord. And now we're to spend time praising the Lord in holiness. And I don't know if that has ever crossed your mind, but, uh, you know, we give God thanks for our health. We give God thanks for our meals. We give God thanks for our provision. But have we ever really sat around and gave God thanks for his holiness? Just to take time to thank him for his holiness. We have a Thanksgiving celebration in the fall in North America. And there's other times that we use thankfulness, you know, for each other. But I was just thinking what it would be like to just to be have a time or a service where we uh, worship God for his holiness and thank him for his holiness. You know what I'm saying? You know, a lot of these things, I'm like you. I'm I, A lot of them I've never thought through. It's only because we've been doing these word studies that I even think about these things. <laughs> and so, and I like to, I, I guess, imagine or, or uh, flesh out the bigger picture. And, you know, when I read things like this, I thought, wow, how do we become thankful for his holiness? How do we praise him for his holiness? You know, and have I ever done that? You know, there are a lot of these things that we're talking about in the morning. I'm I'm with you. It's a first time thought for me, too. And so then after we talk about it, Colin and I usually visit and then and think about how do we apply that? How do we pray that? Oh, God, how do we make that part of our lives? And I thank God for his holiness. Amen. So when we go into Psalm 99, there is uh, verses 1 to 9. The idea of holy is used four times in those verses. And so let's start off. We're going to read the first section all together. It says, the Lord reigns. And I think I love that. The Lord reigns. That's the first thing that the psalmist is one going to say when it comes to understanding holiness that we need to get that the Lord reigns. I've been reading about that in a book that I've been studying in the morning. I get up early and read and have my tea and a little muffin that Colwyn makes and and I spend time and and the game. He was just emphasizing how we are stewards of what God has given us and that God reigns in everything. And wow, I need to remember that. And here he says, the Lord reigns, let the people tr tremble. He dwells between the cherubim, let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the people. Let, the pr let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. And so here, you know, the, the psalmist is getting a vision. And, you know, and he says between the, the cherubims, between the, 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 uh, where God dwells. And, and that's, <laughs> I don't know every time. And I mentioned, I wanted to tell Colin about that. You know, sometimes we talk about under, under the protection of his wings or things like that. Every time they talk about wings or cherubims, most of the time they're thinking about the mercy seat. He dwells between the cherubim. Remember that we had the picture of the mercy seat and there was two angels with their wings hovering over the mercy seat. And they would saw off, often would talk about being underneath the wings of God. That's that idea because the presence of God was on the mercy seat and over the testimony. And here it is. They're reflecting again uh, how they could praise the Lord and how great and awesome is the name of God. So here we, we, we begin to realize that God reigns. He has an awesome name. And not only that, that he is holy. And I think that's what we need to grab a hold of today as disciples. As we're breaking up the, the hard ground and maybe in our hearts or the foul ground or whatever. As we break it up is to remember that our God is holy. 
and he walks in holiness and everything he does he does from holiness everything every gift everything he pours out he does in holiness and you say well why well when we go on it's interesting that in these nine verses it's going to be again to talk about some of the awesomeness of god from a historical point of view uh he goes on and talks in verse 4. The king's strength also loves justice. Now here the word king is capitalized. Talking about God. You have established equality. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. For the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. And worship at his footstool. So we're to praise him and we're to worship at his footstool. That. That means that we're worshiping right at a very close relationship with God, right at the feet of God. And then what does it say when we're worshiping at his footstool? Then again, it says, he is holy. He is holy. He is holy. Praise him. He is holy. Worship him. Worship him as the Holy One. As you, you know, we talked about holy gifts. We talked about how he blesses us and gives us so much. And we just need to worship him as being holy. And then he goes on and, as I said, gives us more testimony of looking back. He talks about Moses and Aaron, the priest. He talks about Samuel. Verse 7, he talks about how he spoke to them by the, by the cloudy pillar and how he had represented himself by the testimony. Again, all going back, all going back to the Holy of Holies, to the Ark, which was holy, the Holy Testimony, and the Holy Mercy Seat. That's where the psalmist, as he begins to get a picture of what that's all about, all he can come up to, come up with, is this. He is holy. Our God is holy. He is holy. And if he's holy... And we're to follow in his footsteps and to be his children and to be disciples of him. We too also need to walk in his holiness. Isn't that beautiful? What a wonderful picture when you think about it. But he goes on in verse 8 and he says, You answered them, O Lord your God. You were to them. Now, I, just before I read this next line, this next line blew me away. So he's thinking about being in the Holy of Holies, he's realizing that God is reigning as king and is in, you know, a holy kingdom. And he reigns from a position of righteousness. And as he reigns from righteousness, that the cloud that covered the tabernacle by day, God spoke to him from there. And the fire that, co that was covering the tabernacle by night, that all the people could see in the surrounding area that he was a holy God and a righteous God, all this. And then as he looked into the tabernacle, you know, past the, the open area, then the holy place, and then the holy of holies, he begins to really get an understanding that our God, that he is holy. But look what he comes up with, the, the, uh, the writer here of this psalm. He says, you have answered them, O Lord, our God. You have answered who? Well, Aaron and Moses, the people in the wilderness, the people who have sought your face, you have answered them, O Lord of God, and you were to them. And this is something that I haven't noticed uh, before. At least I can't remember. It says, you were to them what? God who forgives. Now, in my Bible, the word God is capitalized. The word who is capitalized and the word forgives is capitalized. And it's hyphenated all together. That means it's trying to put it together as one word. God, our holy God is a God who forgives. That's why I think today as we, you know, post this up, we're going to say, you know, that we have holy forgiveness from a holy God. And I'll show you why. Because if he's a God who forgives, he says, though you took vengeance on their deeds, even though that they did wrong things in the wilderness, even though that they had to walk in the wilderness because of their disobedience and unfaithfulness, that you were a God who forgives. And then in verse 9, look what it says here. 
Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy. Can you see how this psalm could be titled with the idea, Praise to the Lord for his holiness? He talks about what God has done, how he has led them, how he has led them in justice and righteousness, how he was with Aaron and Moses, how he was with them by cloud by day and fire by night, how his even the ark of the, of the um, testimony bore testimony of his presence, how on the mercy seat the wings of the seraphim were over and showing and God was speaking from the midst of that and what was coming out of that, even all their disobedience and even all our disobedience, our waywardness and all the things, he says to them that he is a God who forgives and that we should worship him, worship him in his holy hill. Well, you know, Zion is his holy hill and Jerusalem is on the city of our God, his holy city where God dwells. He's saying, go, go to the mountain of God and worship him. Go to the very place of where God is, as Moses did, as he went up onto the mountain and worship him and praise him. Worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. You know, I think that would be such a wonderful thing that we could just grasp that in our hearts, that the Lord, our God, is holy. And he desires that we live in his holy presence. And the only way we can live into his holy presence is to take up that name, which I believe was given to us in verse 8, God who forgives. There is no other way into the kingdom. We come and confess our sin. We come and confess our iniquities and our transgressions. We bring that all before him. We lay it on the altar. We lay it on the, at the foot of the cross. Why do we do that? Because he's a holy God who forgives. Even though we're unholy, even though we're dirty and stained and, and have the the sin nature in our lives. If we would just come to God, he is a God who forgives. He is a holy God who forgives. Isn't that amazing what Psalm 99 is trying to teach us? Well, we got a few more verses to end, to, to, to complete our study in Psalm here. We're going to go over to Psalm 103, verse 1. Because there's more praise going up to God. He says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, do what? All that is within me, do what? Bless his holy name. There it is again. The holy God, the one, the God who forgives, we need to bless. You know, I don't know about you, but if you could grasp this concept, you you wouldn't be able to stop praising God today. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? If, when you when you realize that you've been uh, caught in sins and trespasses and then you come to uh, God who is just and righteous and he forgives you, that should give you enough to say, bless the Lord, praise God, praise God, praise God that he forgives, bless his holy name and all that is within me, bless. Let everything come up and say, oh God, you know, I just want to bless you for all who you are. I just want to bless your holy name because it's all of you and none of us. Bless your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all the benefits. Who forgives you all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction who crowns you with love and kindness and, and tender mercy, who satisfies your mouth with good, thing, good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. Oh, I think sometimes we, you know, if we could just spend more time as a body of believers blessing God, praising God, 
you know, sometimes setting aside all the structure and just say we're coming into the house of God to bless his holy name. We're coming into the house of God to, to, to lift up his holiness. Coming into the house of God to know that God has forgiven us. That we are God. Uh, he is a God who forgives. And that we should bless him. And for what he has done, he has given us great benefits. He has provided for us. He has, he has helped us in all our journey. You know, that should be enough to bless the Lord. Shouldn't it? But often we are so busy looking at all the things of the world, looking at all the calamities that are going on around about us, focusing on all the terrible things instead of just taking a few moments and say, bless the Lord. His name is holy. He has benefited us. He, it has been a great benefit to walk with him. And that's what we need to remember. Well, let's go on over to Psalm 105. Just see what it says over there. And in here is a, is a psalm that's talking about the eternal faithfulness of God. How God has been faithful. How he goes on here. How, how he has touched and anointed his people and his prophets. How in verse 27, he has shown forth signs and wonders. But how people rub darkness rather than light and how they get into rebellion. But he goes on. And again, notice in verse 39 of chapter 105, he says, He spreads a cloud for a covering and fire to give light in the night. The people ask, and he brought quail. And satisfied them with bread from heaven. He opened the rock and water gushed out. And it ran in the dry places like a river. So again, just remembering back. Taking time to remember. The psalmist is trying to say, look what our holy God did. Look what he has done in us and around us and by us and through us. That's our holy God. And then finally in verse 42 for he remembered his holy promises. So God gives us holy forgiveness. God gives, we can worship him because of his, of who he is and his holy name. And now he goes on and said, and remember, God has fulfilled his holy promises. Sometimes we don't get what we want as a child. But sometimes we need to realize that the father when we look back, has fulfilled all his promises. Can you say amen to that? See, can you see why Psalms is such a, a book of worship? Because it's reflecting back on things that they all knew. Maybe we didn't understand. We don't understand the cloud. We don't understand the tabernacle. We don't understand the fire. We don't understand how we've been redeemed and, and brought out of slavery and how God has led and, and, and fed us with bread from heaven and how he has given us meat to eat. And not only that, that he had also been with them and, and provided the water that they needed to live by as a rock. That's what Jesus was saying to them, to the woman at the well, you know, she, the woman at the well said, Jesus, are you greater than Jacob? Jacob dug this well and gave us water, and we're still coming here, you know, hundreds, thousand years later, getting water from the well. And Jesus just says to the woman, yeah, that's great. But let me tell you, the one who's speaking to you now will not only give you, provide for you, in the physical sense, but he is also going to provide for you in a spiritual sense. If you ask of him, Jesus said, you ask of me, I will give you living waters. See, God keeps his promises. That's what it's all about. And he talks about this, that he keeps his holy promises, his covenants. He keeps his word. He keeps it all. Isn't that amazing? The God who forgives, the God who leads, the God who delivers, the God who promises, the God who is holy in name. For he is holy and we are to praise him and to reflect back and that he has fulfilled all his promises. I know a lot of times, I'm you know, no different than many of you, I forget these things. 
I forget, but sometimes when I look back or I read that my testimony that I wrote out or share my testimony with somebody else, I have to begin to, in fact, many times I just begin to cry. I just begin to weep because God has kept his promises. God has kept his promises. He has kept his holy promises. Why are they holy? Because a holy God promised it and a holy God has fulfilled it. And we worship a holy God and his name is holy. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Well, we got one more verse that we're going to look at before we go to prayer. It's over in Psalm 145. And it speaks to us again about how God is holy. Because Psalm 145 is a song of God's majesty and love. It, 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 it Majesty is the idea of, of his kingdom as being a king. And how our king loves and forgives, shows mercy shows righteousness i mean it's just wonderful and david you know he wrote this and i think he's thinking about it as he was king he also knew that god was king in verse 17 it says the lord is righteous in all his ways holy in all his works now some of the translations have changed that word holy and they put gracious but i still like the word holy he is holy in all his works, even though gracious fits too. He's gracious in all his work. But I, I, you know, gracious comes across a little bit differently than the word holy. I like the old King James word where it says he is holy in all his works. Everything he brings forth and does comes from a throne of holiness, comes from a king of holiness, and comes from a kingdom of holiness. Everything that he pours out on our lives, everything he does is from a seat of holiness. What is the seat? The mercy seat. Where are the cherubims? His presence. What is that? It's mercy over what? His testimony. All that he has done is holy. Then he goes on in verse 21. And as the psalmist continues to praise God and give thanks for what God has done, he goes on. He says, my mouth shall speak the praises of the Lord and all my flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. You know, I believe that's why so many people could go to the Colosseum in the time of Rome and be eaten by lions and, and be, be killed by gladiators and be put up on crosses and, and beheaded and tortured and everything else. How could that be possible? Because they weren't looking at who they were. They were looking at who he is. His name is a name that is holy. He is the Holy One of Israel. He has a holy kingdom. He has a holy name. And he sits as a holy God on a throne, which he gives to us grace and mercy, love and gentleness, all those things he pours forth. So if you're needing some of that today in your life, Maybe take time to reflect back on the holy promises of God. Take time to realize that he is holy. And he wants to bless you through his holy name into your life. That he wants to fulfill even more promises in your life. Holy promises. So he could be a holy blessing of forgiveness in all that we do. Amen. Let's pray. Father. We thank you for what the psalmist is telling us and causing us to reflect on. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would just help us, O oh Lord, to, to take time to look back and seeing that you are a God who forgives. But that forgiveness comes out of because you are a God of holiness that shows forth mercy and that you have kept your holy promises. You have been faithful from Genesis and you will continue to be holy and faithful to the last day, to the last verse of the book of Revelation. And we thank you, O oh God, 
that we can have the peace that passes all understanding in our heart because you are a holy God who keeps his holy promises. So Father, just continue to guide and direct us as we walk forth through this day now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. One of the greatest holy promises that God kept is that he sent his son, his holy son, to die on a worldly cross and shed his blood for us. Isn't that amazing? And because of that, even though we should, we should be judged according to death, Jesus has made a way of forgiveness so that we could be lifted up and have eternal life. That's his holy promise. That so whosoever would call upon his name will be forgiven and given eternal life. Isn't that amazing? Bless you. And Lord willing, we hope to see you again tomorrow. Keep on keeping on in our holy God, Jesus Christ. Amen. Love you now. Bye-bye.